to start out. All right, well, good morning once again. We're in James chapter 2, uh, part 5, right, of James. Oof. Yeah. Uh, so, this will address some things that are going on in the world a little bit. We are divided in the world and getting more so every day. And we're social creatures and we're drawn to others for comforting relationships. So there's that. We judge and are judged by each other. We all have biases, prejudices, preferences, likes and dislikes, and we are not as good at hiding them as we think. On a scale of, you know, godly perfection to godly evil, we're somewhere in between. Hopefully working towards that goal of godly perfection and not sliding down to the opposite end. We should be here, but we're somewhere down here. Hopefully not down here. Because of our natural tendency to show favoritism or partiality, as the word is in James today, and these things were happening in local congregations back then, James writes the following instructions and gives another test or evaluation of faith. This is for churches, but individuals as well. And one of the dangers of showing partiality in the local church is that the church can become a social club instead of a healthy family of Jesus followers. I think about uh, Paul at, uh, in Galatians, I believe, where he says there's no more Jew, no more Greek, no more slave, no more free, no male or female, for we are all one in Christ. And that is what the church is intended to be, a family of a bunch of different kinds of people, not all one type, but again, human beings, we naturally draw to our own kind. So, what he says, though, uh, begins in James chapter 2, and let me just uh, ask for God's blessing on this time before we get into that. So, Father, um, you know everything, thankfully, and you know that we are sinful and perfect creatures, but by the grace of of God, yourself, by the power of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit inside of us, your call on our lives to salvation, adoption into your family. We struggle, we try to be different. We are called to be different, and through your power we can live differently. So help us, Lord, as we see this passage in James today to take it to heart, take it to our lives, live it out for your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So he begins here, uh, my brothers, and once again, that brothers is brothers and sisters. So everybody, brethren. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. This sentence there is a complex imperative. because He's covering a bunch of things. It says, Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, your followers of him. And so the imperative is, show no partiality. If you are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism to others. And we'll see why in a minute. But first, James gives an example of how the church was showing partiality in verses 2 through 4. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So this is how the recipients of this letter were showing partiality and in states by doing so, you're sinning and judging and having evil thoughts about another human being. To those who were or who appeared rich, because some people would rent fancy rings in those days to look like they were rich. To those who were or appeared rich, they were giving better seats in the assembly. These are the seats that the Pharisees wanted in Jesus' time, you know, the seats of importance. And to those who were or who looked poor, they were treating them basically like dogs. Here, sit down at my feet. You don't even get to the seat. Stand or sit at my feet on the floor. Similarly, people today show partiality to those who are most like them. 
We almost can't help it, it is natural. Birds of a feather flock together. Fish school with their own kind. You don't see a lot of different animal types hanging out like monkeys and alligators. Although I have seen some funny videos of those. Like I said earlier, we're even being divided more and more every day, focusing on our differences instead of our similarities. That's not good and it is not right. The first century church that James was writing to showed partiality to the rich over the poor. In our country, it's racial or political difference. In Rwanda, it was tribal differences. In India, it was caste differences, or still is, even, even though officially the caste system is outlawed. Rich, poor, every other distinction you can make between humans is sub-biblical, though. Sub-biblical is one of my favorite words from seminary, right? Saying this is the standard for life and everything, and anything not measuring up to that is sub-biblical, or wrong, or sin, or however you want to describe it. Genesis 1.27 states, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. That is Imago Dei, it's Latin for the image of God. And it's the theological understanding that all humans are worthy of the dignity and respect that comes with being created in God's image. No partiality, no favoritism, no prejudices, no exceptions. Partiality is an insult to God the Creator by disrespecting His creation. Furthermore, the way we decide whom to be partial to and whom to disrespect is totally opposite of how God works in his kingdom. Look at verses 5 through 7. James writes, Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? God has chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith, heirs of the kingdom. The rich oppressed them, dragged them into court. Jesus told parables about that. Blasphemed God, and yet they gave them preferential treatment in the church. The world and the kingdom are opposites. It said the kingdom economy is upside down from the world's economy. Economy being what people value, how things work, etc. In the kingdom, the last shall be first, the least or the greatest. God lifts up the downtrodden and brings down the oppressors and the prideful. And in the world today, we look at the rich as successful and worthy of emulating and the poor as those to be avoided. But here's what we need to understand and what we need to change to be more like Jesus. First off, understand that God sees people differently than we do. The world and the kingdom have those opposing economies. So ask yourself, to whom do you show partiality? How can you better love your neighbor as yourself? That's what Jesus said to do in Matthew 19, 19. It's also in Leviticus, which we all know is the greatest book in the Old Testament. Some things we can do to be more like Jesus are expanding our social circle by spending more time with people that are not like us. Former Californians, for instance, I'll give you guys an easy one. Stretch your comfort zone by doing things you don't normally do. Maybe it's going bowling. Maybe it's having a meal someplace other than your favorite restaurant. Watch people and pray for them. Don't think about how you see them or know them, but how God views them, which is found in John 3:16, where it says, "For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life." God loves the world, that's all people. I'm not saying that you have to go hang out at a bar and make friends with people that are there, but just exposing yourself to something different outside of your comfort zone helps you to understand maybe and appreciate God's love for everybody. So we show partiality, but God does not, nor does he want us to. The great commandment is love God and the second is to love others as yourselves. We may try, but at some point we fail, just as the first readers of James's letter did. And so James tells us, them and us, the second thing, partial obedience is disobedience. Verses 8 through 11. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. 
But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Loving others as yourself is the royal law. That's from Leviticus 19.18. While we're saved by grace and forgiven of sins through Jesus' sacrifice, we still must follow God's law. Partiality is a sin, and a sin is a sin is a sin. Partiality is judging people at face value. And the first verse that I had to learn as a Christian is this one in Matthew 7, 1, where Jesus said, Judge not that you not be judged. In verse 2, For with the same judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. Partiality is a violation of God's law. James further writes, the law is interconnected. It's not a point-by-point -point list of do's and don'ts. You don't get credits for doing good and demerits for doing bad. And hope that in the end you have more positive than negative points. This is how Christianity differs from every other religion out there. All of them say, if you do enough good, you might be granted eternal life. Do too much bad and you won't. And that's what James's Jewish audience was raised with. Follow the law. If you break the law, it's not good. That's what the Pharisees believed. And they tried to even make things better, I guess, doing more good, because they added their traditions of men. If this is the law, then this should be even better. Don't do this, so don't do that. Do this, so do even more. James attacks that belief head on with verse 10. Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. Jesus said you must be perfect as my heavenly Father is perfect. If you're not perfect, then you have failed all of it. And by showing partiality, the law was broken. If you break the law, there's a penalty for that violation. The penalty for breaking God's law is death, which, spiritually speaking, is separation from God. If breaking one part of the law is the same as breaking the whole, then the penalty has got to be a doozy, and it is, but thankfully one who could pay that whole violation penalty did. Jesus Christ. That's why we follow him. Out of gratitude for what he did. We don't try to keep the law to earn God's good graces. We, because of his good graces, try to keep the law. So partial obedience is disobedience, and we're talking about partiality or favoritism, or treating others differently. How do we avoid it? Well, know the reasons behind it. It might be sin, it might be pride, having a higher opinion of yourself than of someone else. Partiality also comes from affinity, the natural desire to be with those like us. And so the cure for sin is confession and repentance. And the cure for affinity, like I said before, expand your social circle with new people and new experiences. Partiality is a sin that has been occurring in churches since, as we see, the first century church. It is a sign that Christians have not fully accepted all that Jesus did for them. It's failing to give other people the love that they have received from God. And so James tells his readers to do just that. Give as you have received, in verses 12 and 13. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now in Galatians 5.1, Paul wrote, For freedom Christ has set you free. Jesus also said that uh, when the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. James reminds us, as Christians, we are under the law of liberty, meaning freedom from condemnation, freedom from sins, and from sinful feet. Thinking, sinful thinking. So act like it, he said. Those who judge without mercy have not received mercy. They don't know how to give mercy. And thus they're under condemnation. And so here's the test, as James has been giving his readers, or evaluation of your faith. Do you judge or do you show mercy? Do you give unconditional love that you have received from God? Are you partial or impartial? Of all the things we're supposed to do as Christians, this one seems for me at least, the most difficult. I usually say love God and love other people. 
while at the same time qualifying the people that I will love and showing them partiality. I know I am more partial to some than to others. I think that if non-Christians were told this, that, that this, this show no partiality, that if this is the only thing you need to do to earn salvation is to not show favoritism to other human beings, it would be enough. It would be enough for them to realize there's no way a person can earn their own salvation. It's impossible. And that is a fact. And that would be the time to point them to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 7. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. These statements describe someone who realizes they are sinners and cannot save themselves and are in need of a savior. The poor in spirit, when you realize, man, there's no way I can do that. You become broken. And then you mourn, like, if I can't do it, then how can I possibly be saved? And then the meek, that attitude of, well, if I can't do it, there must be someone who can, and I have to humble myself before that person. The Savior they need is Jesus, whom God sent for all who will believe, because God's love for us, for all of us. How can you love impartially if you don't know what impartial love is? Through Jesus, we are free from sin to be impartial to all. We freely receive grace and mercy, mercy and grace we can freely give. But truly, we can only give it because of our relationship with God and only by the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us. So to give as you've received, work on deepening your relationship with God. Because you can't give what you haven't received. But also the more you receive, the more you'll have available to give. And so to do this, spend some time in quiet contemplation about your relationship with God. What have you done to deserve it? Hopefully you know nothing. What do you deserve for what you've done? Hopefully you know death, separation from God. What have you received and said? God's deep, deep love, forgiveness of sins, etc. When we deeply understand God's love for us, our love for others will grow and we can truly begin to show no partiality. So the early church showed partiality to some and not to others, which was a negative testimony to God. When somebody walks into a church, they should be welcomed, not told to sit down on the floor. The passage is another one that shows the layers of scripture, the top layer. I mean, if you just look at it and it's like, okay, church, don't show partiality to the rich. Because churches will do that. Churches have budgets and you know, got to make budget. So here's a rich person that will help us make budget. That would be the top superficial layer. And now, if you think about it deeper, the church should know, partial, show no partiality to anyone. Everyone should be welcome. Deeper still is a Christian individually should show no partiality to others. And then finally moving from passive to active. Because, <clears throat> you know, you can show no partiality by ignoring everybody. Like, I'm not being impartial to everybody, I'm ignoring everybody. That would be part, passive. But actively, James says, give as you've received. Show the love of God to others as he has given it to you. So partiality is judging others at face value and is a sin, but we're required to keep all of God's law. And God gave us his love unconditionally, that's how we are to love others. Our faith in Christ can be measured by our partiality towards others. And so it's right there. Partiality is contrary to God's character, contrary to the royal law, which is love your neighbor as yourself. Inconsistent with the Christian faith, inconsistent with God choosing the poor. He lifts up those that are downtrodden. It's consistent with the rich persecuting the poor and faithful. That's what they did then, maybe still today. And it is a sin, a transgression of divine law. So, I think there's one more. This week, be aware of your partialities towards others. Take note, confess them to God, ask for his help to see people as he sees them. Pray for a softened heart that we might honor and glorify God and share the love of Christ with all. Father, well, thank you. 
pray that your words have awakened something inside of us cause us to see the world more fully through your eyes fill our hearts with the love that you've given us that it may overflow and pour out to others we come in contact with even Lord others that we know I know sometimes I show more partiality to strangers than to my own family but you are love God you have enough love for everyone so pour that into us that we can pour it out to all to honor and glorify you and keep your name holy we pray in Jesus name Amen